Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Katie Spoden. I am an assistant director over at the Polsky Center. Um, the Polsky Center is the University of Chicago's Department for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and we are very happy to welcome uh, Michael Rukowitz with us today. He is going to be um, giving a workshop on financial accounting for entrepreneurs. Uh, Michael is a partner in the assurance and advisory practice at Frank Rimmerman and Company and leads the firm's venture fund group. Um, for questions today, feel free to put your questions for Michael in the chat box and I can ask those questions um, as Michael is presenting and we'll also have some time at the end um, for some questions as well. So with that, uh, Michael, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Katie. Uh... Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on uh, whereabouts you are in the country. I'm on the West Coast, so it's still morning here. Um, thanks for joining us. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of an overlook of what we're going to discuss today is a lot of accountants will come on here and sort of go into the you know brass tacks of you know how sort of accounting works and give you that kind of workshop. I'm not going to focus on that. Given you're in an entrepreneurial program here and hopefully going to be founders of companies, if not already, what I'm going to try and focus on here is things that I've seen that can go wrong, things that may be able to help you as a founder identify issues and just be more aware of, from an accounting perspective, things that you might be able to identify. And in doing so, actually save your business from some heartache and yourself some sleepless nights um, over the course of running a business. So with that in mind, I wanna talk about firstly why accounting is really important for founders. Um, I'm someone who loves sports. I'm someone who's played sport their whole life, um, somewhat competitively originally in Australia before moving to America. And, you know, when you're playing sport, there's usually a scoreboard that's visible while you're on the field and you can see how you're performing. Are you winning? Are you losing? Is it competitive? And then here you are uh, running a business and when you look at the financial statements, be it the profit and loss, the cash flow, the balance sheet, to me, that's your scorecard of the business. So anyone who's played competitive sport or any kind of activity who's got that streak of competitiveness in them, you know, looking at how to win and how you're doing is important. Running a business is no different. And those financial statements are the scorecard of your business. So playing sport and not understanding how to read the scoreboard I don't think any of us would do. Running a business, you really want to understand how to read that scorecard as well. So what does it mean for a founder? Well, a founder, when you're starting a business, you've got a couple of things to do for the success of the business. And let's just start at the right at the beginning. You have an idea. To go and raise capital, to get people excited about the business, you're going to actually have to have a model that talks about the P&L, the balance sheet, what it could look like and your cash flow. And, and at this point, it really is, you know, an imagination of what could happen, what your idea could turn into. But you still have to be able to sell that idea. And an investor wants to be sold on what it could turn into from their scorecard perspective, which is the PL, the balance sheet, and the cash flow, and market share and what it could, what it could eventually become. So if you're a founder and you don't understand how all these things come together come together, you're going to really struggle to actually get buy-in from the investors or a banker, someone who's going to maybe help you kickstart this business if you can't actually interpret the data and turn it into something that a business person may understand better. Um, so that's right at the start. Let's fast forward, say, three to four years into the business. Now you've got revenue, um, you've got clients, customers, you're doing well. A, a board member one of your original investors is going to want an update on how your business is doing. So you can go to them and you can say, hey, we've signed a thousand customers. They're all paying a thousand dollars each. That equals X in revenue. That's great. Well, show me how that looks. If the business is actually costing them $1,200 per customer to get, you're actually losing $200 a customer. So you're going to need to be able to show that investor and explain to the investor through these statements, these financial statements, um, how your business is doing. And you're the person, the founder, the CEO, um, along with maybe a CFO, depending on how you're doing um, size-wise, has to be able to articulate this message. So thinking you are a 
you know, let's say you're someone coming through the business school or the engineering school and you're, in, and you're a coder of technology. That's great. That's your superpower. You know how to code. You've got this great idea. You're going to take over the world with a business. If you can't turn that into financial language, the idea is just not going to go very far because people aren't going to buy into what your vision is. You're going to have to put it into different terms because they're not coders. They don't understand that. They understand how you might monetize that product. And then how do they look at the world? The people who are going to give you money are going to say, well, how much could we end up selling this business for? Whether that's some form of multiple of revenue. So if you have a dollar of revenue and we think we can sell it for five times revenue, we're going to sell it for five bucks. That's the multiple. Same with EBITDA, which for those who don't know what EBITDA is, it's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Effectively, the cash inbound of the business, the positive cash of the business. And some people will um, buy or sell a business on that. My message to you is you don't need to be the expert in financial accounting at your company. You need to just know, understand it well enough to be able to present on it and articulate the message of what's going on in the business. And a lot of founders either fall into the trap of knowing nothing or they get too far into the detail. You sort of want that Goldilocks balance here. Um, and there's people out there who can help you do that. Um, when you think of a business that you founded, the things, there's a really um, important or very uh, famous saying from a politician many years ago. And it was, you know, it's essentially saying, what you don't know or understand is the part that will hurt you the most. Um, and this is it's really relevant for business. And what I wanted to talk about here is as a founder, um, how do you understand that something that's going on in your business may come back to bite you really hard um, later on in the business and you just weren't even aware. And the most common example we see um, is regarding sales tax. And, and to give you a little bit of an anecdotal story on this, um, over the holiday break, I was talking to my brother-in-law and he's, he's in the diligence department of a very big accounting firm. And all he does is help people uh, work out whether they're going to buy or sell or invest in companies. And he sort of chuckled and said, well, the number one thing I find and the number one thing I look for is exposure to sales tax. Straight away, I can usually find some money to take off the price that someone's trying to sell the business for. It's that obvious to them when they're looking for it. And it is one of the biggest, if not the most common deal breakers in a smaller business acquisition. So what is it? Um, the rules of sales tax across the country vary state by state, making it incredibly complex. Uh, the rules were written when businesses were really simple. By that, hey, I'm gonna sell a TV and we have to, it's a tangible product. It's very clear, we sold one TV. We have to charge say 10% sales tax on it. Well, now you've got these software companies selling different types of products, intangible goods as, as we would call them. And some states tax them, some don't. So as a founder, you need to understand just at a high level, I'm selling something. Do I need to charge sales tax as part of my contract? And it really is on you. You're writing the first contract, hopefully with a good attorney, but you need to understand whether you need to charge sales tax because the government, each state government actually says you are relying, they're relying on you to collect and remit. If you don't collect, you still need to remit. So let's say over a five year period, you have a, um, a ton of money that's come in through revenue, whatever you've not collected in sales tax, that's a liability that you now owe that state. It's not gonna be showing on your balance sheet because it's not there. It should be there. You didn't know because maybe you didn't understand the balance sheet well enough and how all this works, but there should have been something accruing there on the, as a liability that you owe to this state and then getting paid. Well, over five years, you can imagine 10% of your revenue just grows and accumulates over a five year period. That's a big number that's suddenly not there that should be. So anyone who comes to buy your business is essentially gonna say, well, we're not paying it. We're gonna pay you less to buy your business and we're gonna put that amount in a separate account that's called an escrow account. And we'll pay it on your behalf when the liability becomes due from that government. So you just lost X dollars from your business that you should have collected from your client or customer 
and remitted. It should never have been your money that was lost, but you as a founder potentially just turned it into something you now have to pay. So under, that's a high level understanding that I'd you know, really wanna focus on and just be aware of things that could go wrong. Um, and many founders don't even understand that that's out there. So I've got three examples here. What does ice cream, software, and in this case, a steel fabricator have in common? They're completely different businesses. I like ice cream. I use a computer every day. And, you know, sometimes I, I have to bang some steel to get something to work. But why would it be important from an accounting perspective? And how do they all relate? And, and the reason I chose three just unbelievably different businesses and is to really give you an insight that the same things come up consistently, no matter what the business is that you find as a founder. So don't think your business is unique in the sense that these problems won't occur to you because they really can, um, even though you're building something maybe that's never been built before, which is really cool. Just know that there's things that can go wrong and they're very consistent. So let's talk about the ice cream company. Uh, this was about eight years ago. I was asked by an investor to look into this ice cream company. They were doing really well. They needed about $100,000 in financing to go build out a new store where they could then you know, double their size. They had one store, they wanted to make a second store, they needed 100K to invest and fit it out. And then they worked out if they did that, that, that 100K would turn into about a million dollars of revenue, 300K worth of profit per year. Really good investment for this person. Um, so we looked into it. Uh, kicked the tires on, on the accounting statements that had been done by the founder. They didn't use someone else. The founder was doing this. And within the first three to four hours of working um, on this deal, I did all this myself. I found that the founder hadn't been paying payroll tax. So payroll tax is an amount that you're supposed to remit to the federal government based on the level of your payroll. Just wasn't getting paid. So the exposure over three years of not doing this was $100,000 is what I worked out. So this person actually needed $200,000 worth of investment, $100,000 to pay the liability they haven't paid and $100,000 then to reinvest into this new business um, opportunity. Needless to say, that deal did not go ahead. And I just read actually about three months ago that that company actually finally got some money. This was four or five years ago. That's how long it took them to get out of that hole to where someone would want to invest in it, to give you an idea. And it was a very simple, Thing that could have been dealt with over time that wouldn't have been as harmful, but a hundred thousand dollars, you know, building up actually becomes quite punitive. So then the software company, we run to that one. Well, this was very similar to the example I gave before on the on the sales tax. It's a fifty million dollar revenue company. Uh, they hadn't paid sales tax for four years, I think. Uh, it was actually longer, but I think four years is what we worked out was the longest the authorities could go back. And as a result. Um, when they sold the company, the acquirer basically said, it was, they sold the company for about $200 million. They said, we're gonna keep $20 million and put it in that account. So the founder and all the employees and stockholders basically lost 10% of the proceeds off the top that they'd earned to build simply because they had contracts and a process that wasn't remitting. And all of this could have been found earlier if there was a little bit more financial literacy to understand the ramifications of the contract. And then the machinist. Um, this one, again, was a payroll tax issue. I, it was in Ohio. I flew out there and I, I met with the founder and the founder was a second generation with his dad um, and founded this company. And he uh, was looking to sell the family business for about 80 million bucks. This was just for his family. This was their payday. This was their legacy. And the deal didn't end up getting over the line because of the same issue where they had significant payroll taxes that hadn't been remitted for a long time. And they had to dig their way out of that hole. And all of these things are, are easily identifiable. If as a founder, you understand that, hey, I've got payroll, I've got employees. The simple question is, are we paying all the taxes regarding that? And or can I see it in the cash flow? In the cash flow statement, you should see amounts going out to payroll tax, amounts going out to wages, sales tax coming in and sales tax being remitted. That is the depth of the expertise you need to have. Just be aware that it's there. You don't need to be the one who's creating the cash flow, the balance sheet, or things like that. You just need to be aware that these things could go wrong. Okay.
Hey, Michael, there's a question in yeah. the chat for you. Is there a general rule of thumb for overheads and SGA other than salary we can use for initial calculations? Uh, say that again. Is there a general rule of thumb for overhead and SGA um, salary that we can use for initial calculations? Yeah, that's a good question. It really is industry dependent because um, a lot of the time it's gonna be like a percentage of revenue. I'll use for, for our example of our business, we're very labor intensive, very high labor cost. Those kind of expenses are about 20% of our business. Uh, for a software company, and then that's 20% of revenue, right? Um, for a software company, you know, it could be as, as low as 3% um, later on. In the early days, it might be as high as 40 or 50% just as you scale. So it really depends on, on where you're at. But if you, if you think about it um, just holistically and you said payroll was a million bucks, for example, and you had no revenue, so you didn't have that uh, sort of ability to, to work out that percentage, I would say like rent could be 6% of my overall cost. Um, then electricity and utilities is probably another 5%, 3 to 5%. And then you throw in some other things, you, you could get to like 15% of your payroll costs is where you get to. But it really is going to be dependent on what business you're going into because there's other businesses that have no payroll. Um, and then those costs might be really small because everyone's remote. So your business model matters. And just a point of clarification, uh, does the payroll tax refer to the Medicare and Social Security payments for employees? It does. That's exactly what it is. So it's about 6% um, for the, well, and it could be 12 if you didn't play both sides. So it can add up really quickly. Okay, cash flow and balance sheet. We put together a little graph here. And, and what we wanted to really show is, well, firstly, the cash flow is you know, review of an operational impact for a period of time, similar to the P&L. The P&L is really, profit and loss is really talking about, you know, how much money you're making on a, maybe an accrual basis, not a cash basis. The cash flow is really showing, are you generating cash or are you losing cash, you know, through that period of time? And the balance sheet is really at a point in time, this is what the business assets and liabilities look like. So with that in mind, I thought it would be pretty interesting to show you how interwined these two are. And if you have a look at this little diagram graph that we have here, you'll see that the same things sort of marry up on both sides, whether it's on the cash flow or the balance sheet, they can help you. And what the first one is, you know, reflect the strength and weakness of the health of the business. If you have a strong balance sheet, most people will look at that and what does strong mean? Very asset rich, low liabilities. So you have a lot of cash, a lot of certain types of assets and very few um, debts to the bank or someone else that you owe money to. The cash flow, from a strength perspective, if you're generating positive cash, as in there's more money coming in than going out each month, each quarter, each year, that's going to reflect that it's a very strong, healthy business. What's interesting about that is if it's positive, it's actually making the balance sheet stronger because you're increasing your assets. Therefore, the balance sheet's becoming more asset rich. If it's negative, then the balance sheet's assets are going down because cash is actually going down, just like the cash flow is telling you. So they're very interwined in from a snapshot and a point of time, how healthy your business is. And having one or the other allows you many things to do as a founder. And I, and I wanted to illustrate some of them and why it's so important. If you have strong cash flow, you know, you can acquire a competitor, you can make a strategic acquisition. If you have a strong balance sheet, you can do the same thing. You may just take on some debt to do it or take on some more capital from an investor to do it because someone's willing to invest in the balance sheet. It's, it's, it's strong, your company looks good. Um, the cash flow perspective and the balance sheet, again, from a borrowing perspective, they're interwined because if you have strong cash flow, a bank will probably lend to you because they know you have the ability to pay it off. Um, so that was, well, and I just gave you the example on the balance sheet straight up itself. Weak cash flow may actually leave you behind from a competition perspective because you're not reinvesting in your business enough. And the competitor who has strong cash flow or a strong balance sheet in this case may actually be investing more heavily into the same business line and actually take market share. And it leads to you actually being in this self-perpetuating system. If you're the one with the strong cash flow, you can keep buying market share 
if you're the weak cash flow or weak balance sheet, your competitor who is stronger could actually do that. So those things are really intertwined and understanding that relationship um, is really important. We'll talk a little bit more about the actual cash flow impact um, a little bit later in the presentation. I wanted to give you some real life examples of, of that graph that we just talked about, um, where strong cash flows, you know, they're typical in tech companies where the margin's really high. We talked about from that question, where tech companies have margins in the 80 to 90% range. Um, they allow for huge investments of cash back into the business. And if, if you just think about that, if I sell something for a dollar, it costs me somewhere between 10 and 20 cents to actually produce that product. That's 80 cents to 90 cents that you get to keep. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to reinvest it? Are you going to go buy other companies? That strong cash flow really gives you options. And I, I want to give you some examples of, you know, sort of these four biggest names. And I'm based in Silicon Valley, so I'm a little biased in the companies I've chosen here. Amazon's not from there, but the others are. Um, you know, Amazon Web Services, they've been in the news of late for, you know, for different reasons. But they're, an, they're a business portion of Amazon where massive amounts of money have been invested in them because they're now the, you know, they're basically the internet for nearly every company in, in America. Um, definitely startups where they host your company. They hold, they hold the servers. You rent from them a server to run your business off, whether it's just your internet, whether it's uh, actually selling the product, the code that you're going to deliver. It's all held for the most part. Most companies are starting on Amazon Web Services. So there was Amazon reinvesting all their profits and free cash flow into a new business line that's now made a lot of the world and definitely startups in America dependent on their services. Then they use, they use some of that free cash flow to do something else. Anyone who is a gamer online or watches um, you know, TV or some kind of uh, tube kind of thing through the internet has probably heard of a company called Twitch. Amazon decided years ago to go and buy Twitch for $970 million. They had free cash flow to spend that much money. Um, and then of course, for other people who aren't gamers, the other example of late was they went and bought the grocery outlet Whole Foods and they had this free cash flow. So there's a company that used their free cash flow to do, you know, two things. One, build a brand new business within their business uh, with the Amazon Web Services from scratch and go and acquire other companies to make their business better. And that strong cash flow really allowed them to do it. And, and all they did is they converted cash, which was an asset on their balance sheet, to another asset on their balance sheet, which is now these business lines or companies that they put in underneath. Netflix. I think I read, you know, Netflix got past some ridiculous amount of subscription uh, this this year or this month with with everyone being in COVID. Um, and most people on this call, I suspect, probably subscribe to them. And what people don't understand is they're one of the largest spenders on content in the world. In the Out of every company in the world, they spend more on content than nearly anyone else. The reason they're able to do it is they're also one of the most highly cash flow companies in the entire world. If you look at their revenue per employee that they have, it's just incredible. No one's ever seen anything really like it. Um, and they're very local to here. And I'll share with you, everyone who works there is driving the brand new Tesla or, or above in car because they're just making money hand over fist. They can just do whatever they want. Um, and what they did again, think about what they did. They used their free cash flow to then invest and buy new content in this case, movies that we watch through the internet at home, and they just turn that cash asset into a new asset that they're monetizing, and that's the IP of that content. Google, you know, everyone's, I suspect, heard of, seen, used Google. They acquired um, YouTube back in 2006 for $1.65 billion using their free cash flow. You know, but they've also invested in a whole bunch of companies internally um, to do that. And then the last one here is Facebook. I, I suspect everyone has used Facebook or seen it. They, um, you know, they've done the same thing. They bought Oculus, which everyone thought was just a crazy price for $2 billion in 2014. And these four companies are really just really good examples of how folks are using that cash flow to enhance their business and make it better and strengthen their balance sheet and consistently upgrade their cash flow with even more with that investment.
if that makes sense. So the next slide sort of just talks about this, but I wanted to break it down into what I'll call an old school model and the new school model. The old school model, if you think about how businesses were built 50 to 80 years ago, people were building manufacturing plants. So there was very capital intensive because what people did was they built tangible products like a, call it a coffee mug, but that was all made in a factory. So the old school model was you made a product and you invested all this cash into um, hard assets, the factory. And that gave you a very strong balance sheet because you had all these assets, all this factory was on your balance sheet. And then that factory generated free cash flow, hopefully, if the product was successful um, for your business. And that's how businesses were made. Then you look at Google. Well, Google's business, we're using that as the example, they don't have any factories. They don't have anything like that um, around the world. What they have is a whole bunch of people who have coded an algorithm to search the internet better than anyone else in the world. And that's just code sitting out there. And you think of that kind of business, it probably cost Google just as much to build that algorithm and get it as well as it did as to build a factory in real terms, but there's no, nothing to see for it as in it's not there um, where we could all just drive by and all you can do is drive by this, you know, office building in Mountain View that, you know, there's people working there for Google. It's just a very different um, way to get there, but it was the same way. You had to invest cash to build some other asset for your balance sheet. And, and what I'm trying to get at consistently here is if you can produce a business that has high cash flow and you understand how to read that and make sure you're doing that, your balance sheet will consistently get stronger and your business will be better for it. Um, there's obviously other ways as a, as a founder to have a strong balance sheet and have a stockpile of cash. And that's right at the bottom. You know, to get a kickstart, you'll go to a venture fund or a PE fund or the bank or maybe your mum and dad or a rich auntie and uncle and sort of beg them all for some cash. And to do that, that'll give you your initial capital, but you've got to be able to show them in what I talked about earlier, that P&L balance sheet, um, and cash flow, what it could turn into. And that will allow you then to have success early on with these folks. The next slide, these are terms, you know, part of this was to give you some terms that you're going to consistently hear as a founder and, and be asked about and be challenged on. And I want to give you a little bit of financial literacy on those and what they mean and why they're important. We talked about a revenue multiple before we talked about an EBITDA multiple and that's how people are going to potentially value your business. I want to talk about cash burn. Now cash burn is essentially how much cash are you using negative cash where you have less cash coming in than you do going out. How much cash are you using each quarter, each month, each year? People call that cash burn. You're burning cash. That's okay for an early company. You don't have customers yet. You're building something. Understanding how long you have of those kind of months where you're burning cash at say a million dollars a month and you have 12 million in the bank, that leads to the phrase cash runway. You have 12 months worth of cash, million dollars burning, I have 12 in the bank, I've got 12 months. So those terms are things that you're gonna be able to need to explain to an investor when you take their money or you're asking for more money and understanding that from a business perspective because you need to know how much cash is leaving the building to be able to control how fast you're growing the business. Maybe you need to slow down a little bit on the spend. Maybe I need to start monetizing this and focusing on customers now to reduce that because I actually need you know, 13 months to get this product perfect in my mind. So you've got to find a month. You've got to extend that runway a month. And these are things as founders that are, are really important. Um, and we, the very first slide, we talked about being able to sell the vision of your company that you're fund, you founded or you're building to someone who's going to hopefully invest in your company. Showing them the cash burn is important because they understand the risk of how quickly and how long the money they invest is going to last. And the cash runway is really important. We're going to talk about that um, right at the end in why that's important to understand and how that can affect you at different points of the business. Um, and what I would suggest to you as someone who's 
a founder of a company or starting a company from scratch or becoming a friend of someone who's starting it and going in to help them is you really want to be able to look at the cash flow, look at the balance sheet, and from that snapshot, identify if there's problems in the business. Is there something here in these numbers that's really telling us something's not working? And that could be we're just spending way too much on employees versus how quickly we're getting this built. Maybe you just can't code what you're trying to build quick enough and you don't need as many employees because those extra employees aren't actually helping you get there quicker. You're better off saving that cost or that burn of cash on those two employees to extend your runway so the other employees can work on it long enough. And that's maybe how you turn that 12 into, into 13 months. Um, this is the one I wanted to talk to you about when it comes to understanding your cash burn runway and when to raise money and why. If you obviously, we talked about it before, if you raise money, it becomes an asset on your balance sheet, your balance sheet looks strong. Your asset rich all of a sudden, you now have cash at your disposal. You're able to do a lot of things with that. Um, it increases your runway, of course, because you've got cash. You can reinvest. You can choose how long and how quickly to spend it. What's really important is when to raise money and why with those in mind. So let's just assume for this example, you've started the company up, your mom, your dad, your rich auntie or uncle, someone you know has, has graciously given you enough money to get this company of yours off the ground. You, you, you're looking at it and you've sold this idea, you've put it on paper and you've built this cash flow, and you're like, I got my first round, an investor come in, fantastic, raised $2 million. And you, 12 months after raising that $2 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but you'd be surprised how people throw that kind of money around in Silicon Valley. So let's say you got that and you're 12 months in and you're looking at it and I've, you've burned about $800,000. You still have $1.2 million of cash in the bank. You think that's going to last you 12 months, okay, of what you're doing based on your cash burn. So if you're doing that, when do you, but you know that's only going to get you so far, you still need another $5 million in your mind, in your projections, in your model to actually build what you need to build. When do you raise the money? Do you raise the money with a million dollars in the bank or do you raise it with zero in the bank and or somewhere in between? And the truth is, it's a really delicate balance for you as the founder because you don't want to go and raise money when you have zero in the bank because Everyone knows you need money right now. You are desperate for money right now. They're going to basically pick and choose, one, how much money to give you, on what terms, which could mean, you know, you might think your company is worth $100 million and they're going to say, well, you can have this money, uh, but we're going to value it at $50 million. So you just gave up 2x of the ownership of the business that you were expecting to give up because you waited to the very last minute. So if you went a little earlier where you weren't so desperate and they bought into everything that you were talking about, they may have been willing to pay greater than 50, maybe not the 100, maybe the whole 100. But you had the choice to walk away from that deal and go find another one or, you know, and gave yourself that link, just that length of time where you were not coming across as desperate. Um, and that's really important. And the opposite is also true. If you go too early, you might then be projecting that your company's worth $100 million and you're putting all these things together and, and showing that model. And an investor looks at it and is like, you just don't have enough traction yet. I think your company's worth 50 million bucks. And you're going to have to sit there and say, well, do I take the money or do I run, the, run with it and gamble a little bit and go another quarter and actually build the business up just that little bit further and by building up a little bit further, you can then go back to that investor or a different one and show them that you uh, have a little bit more value in the business now. And it's not worth 50, it's closer to that 100 because our bookings or our customers or our clients that came in really spiked in that quarter, just like we told you it was going to. It's not on paper now, it really is. So understanding your runway, understanding your cash burn, which are, you know, they're just so interwined is really crucial for you as a founder to make the right business decisions and the right business calls at the right time. So we talked about the things that could go wrong by not knowing 
you know, with taxes and, and little things like that, that could really bite you when you go to sell the business. If you don't understand your burn and your runway, you might actually get yourself into trouble as you try and negotiate. And I'll, I want to give you one example of when you go to sell a company. So we use an example where you were sort of going for that second tranche of cash. Someone had given you, you're, you're burning through it, a large um, amounts of cash. Let's fast forward another five years from there. If you go out and you're looking to sell the company, you can have the best company um, that's growing out of this world, but the profit's not there. Like it's still revenues growing, but you're still having to invest to sort of make the revenue grow greater and greater. But you know, if you do that, at some point you hit scale where the amount of investment you're going to put in is, is constant, but the revenue just keeps expanding. If you went out there and you raised money and you had very zero, or you were going to sell the business and you had very little cash in the bank, I've seen this where PE funds in particular, but also public companies will sit there and wait until you're in that position. Because once again, they know you're kind of desperate to get the money. And in good times, like we've been in, there's other venture funds, other PE funds who will make the deal. But if the economy turns a little bit and all of a sudden it's sort of the last person standing, those companies, whether it's a PE fund or whether it's a public company that have really strong balance sheets, that's when they take advantage of the moment and they seize that opportunity. And unfortunately, you're the person who they're seeking. You're desperate. So burn runway knowing where your business at and what you're trying to achieve with these steps whether you're at business step number one two three four or five are really important for you as a founder to understand that and what your cash flow and balance sheet look like for the health of your you know life's work in some cases you don't want to be the one who's left at the altar and and giving up what you're what you're there to do when it was your baby and, and your life's work you want to get what you deserve and everyone else is, who's worked hard for it. And these are the things that can really hurt you. Um, move on to this slide. It's the last slide. And it, it's, I want to spend a couple of minutes on it and then open it up to questions or, or finish if you don't have any. Um, but this is, we talked about at the start that you don't need to be the expert in these areas. You just need to know enough to identify if there's an issue. And I, I want to go through these five, sort of groups and talk about why they're really important to you as a founder and as a business owner um, along the way. So a strong board member. People think if I can go raise $2 million from someone and they want to be on my board, that's great. They gave me $2 million. But if you have three people who are all willing to give you the $2 million, the separator for me is what value are they going to add to you if they're sitting on the board? They're the one who you're presenting to. They're the one who's challenging you, making you better. Making you better means the business is better. Hopefully they're bringing things to the table that you're just not able to do, whether that's introductions to potential customers, whether that's identifying by looking at the P&L um, cash flow saying, hey, you're not paying sales tax. Shouldn't we be paying sales tax? Has someone looked at that? Um, 12 months out of runway, you know, that cash burn uh, runway running out. Should we be looking to raise money now so we're not caught short in 12 months time and, and sort of get taken advantage of? Those kind of decisions from people who have done it before and surrounding yourself, that saves you as a first time founder. You learn from them, you're better for it. So understanding what a strong board member can do to your business when you take their money um, potentially from their fund is crucial. That's who's aligned with you. You're, they're partners with you. You want them to be helping you, not just um, passive in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I'd be amiss as an accountant to not talk about the importance of a CFO, uh, not doing us justice, but also an accountant or an attorney who understands your industry versus just a CFO. Your industry, like we talked about with all those tech companies earlier, they were all doing different things. They're all tech companies. So someone who's a CFO or attorney says, hey, I'm a tech company, CFO or attorney. But are you? What I'm trying to build is more akin to an old school business where I'm building this server farm at Amazon Web Services. And I need to understand how to do all those things right. That's more you know, like someone who was building a factory um, or some kind of farming institution, right? Like you're building something that is tangible. So you need to find someone who knows how to model that is the question earlier 
on the margin of excluding salaries, what are those costs like? A CFO who understands your industry that you're going down knows those things on the back of their hand. Someone who doesn't will put together something that could be look great on paper, but it's totally irrelevant because it's not made for your industry. And an attorney is the same thing. The attorney is really important. You'll see it three times on this, on this list. General attorney, the attorney to fundraise. As you go and raise money from investors, banks, you want an attorney who's done it before. They have an agreement in place that has been tried and tested so many times that anyone who's looking at it knows it's a good contract for both sides. You don't want to be wasting your time when you're trying to build a company on legal speak, legal ease on a contract just because you went and got a cheap attorney who's never done this before. You're burning time. You're better off investing that time in your business. So a good attorney um, helping you fundraise with those documents will save you time and money in the end, even if the sticker shock looks like you're paying more upfront. You'll be better off for it. Sales contracts. Once again, attorney. Um, if you look back at some of those examples I gave you, sales tax was the biggest issue for most companies that we see, especially when they're smaller in size. And it sounds crazy, especially for someone coming from Australia, because this was like a massive company, but a company worth about $500 million um, and under, this is their biggest issue when they're selling uh, that we see a lot of. Getting the contracts written the correct way from day one, because you use the good attorney, we will, you as a founder save you all that heartache of things you didn't know about sales tax, whether I need to collect, whether I don't need to collect. Good attorney, good advice, basically allows you to scale with that agreement for each state that you expand into with being able to sleep at night, not knowing that this is not going to hurt you later on. And then later stage, and later stage is, is all different and relative, but I, I always say a company that's doing about $10 million in revenue, and I call that later stage because depending on the business that you're in, that may take four or five years to get to that. Just in what you've built, it may take 15 years um, to get to that. But once you get to it, you sort of um, take off like a rocket ship. Um, and at that point, you want to have someone who's helping you do an audit and helping you with income taxes. Because at that point, you've got serious revenue. There could be income tax obligations in different states because all the rules are different for income tax as well, that you want to handle. And the audit, the reason the audit's important, um, and I'm on the audit side, so I'll give you, you know, you can take the bias away, hopefully, is there's two reasons. One, some of those things that we talked about, sales tax, will identify and help you, and um, you can then get them corrected. It's an internal uh, identification by using us, and you get to fix it. You have it all fixed by the time you want to sell the business or go raise that next round. So it, it's like going to the doctor one-on-one -on -one rather than being you know, in the doctor's office out in the audience and everyone's seeing what's going on in your medical exam. It's a way for you to do it behind the scenes, get your house in order and build a better business for it. And then um, the other thing about an audit, if you read about everything that's in the media right now is the biggest craze right now is these SPACs, right? These special purpose acquisition corporations. Um, and for folks in Illinois and Chicago, that's always been there. They've, they've, it's actually been a mainstay of, of their financial model locally. But it's now, and it was in Wall Street for a while, but now it's really Main Street on, in New York and San Francisco Bay Area where people are using these vehicles. The hidden secret of you've built this great company and there's a public company that's been set up to buy you, this SPAC, um, one of the biggest things you need is to actually be ready. And one of the things to be ready with is an audit because that public company has to be able to say that the company they're buying was audited and it slips in. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm an auditor by trade here, but, and I recommend getting an audit when you get to certain size, not doing it for just the sake of it because there's no, there's no benefit to you. But at the right point, bringing in folks like ourselves or a tax expert or the right attorney at the right time, there's an inflection point in your business and you get the benefit from that for the longer term. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, hopefully I didn't bore you to death. Hopefully you got a little bit out of it. Um, and I tried to try to make this a little bit different from an accounting perspective where I gave you real examples of a founder where things can go wrong um, and things to be on the look for and hopefully just be aware of as you are building a business, trying to change the world.
Thank you so much for that information, Michael. Um, everyone, feel free to put some questions in the chat. Uh, we have some a few more minutes left um, for some Q&A. But Michael, I'll just start with a question from myself um, to give people some time to think. But how can an entrepreneur evaluate those key players that you mentioned? And what should people be looking out for when they're trying to determine, you know, how do you figure out who might be a good attorney and best fit for you in terms of those players that you mentioned? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question and it's sort of the right question. Um, what I, I say this to people who are looking, when I'm talking to someone, right? I'm trying to sell um, personally that I may be good at what I'm doing and I want them to believe that. And, and there's a few ways for them to get there so they can then not feel like I've sold them on something that's not true, but they feel 100% comfortable. And, and this is what I would do if I was in their shoes is one, ask their friends if they've worked with us and their experience. So that's something you should do as a founder. You've got friends who went through business school, hopefully, or have started a company. Who are they using? What is a service like? What's their expertise like? Is it the same industry? That's great. That ticks a few boxes. And then the other thing I, um, I think you should always try and get out of the service provider is try to get them to be candid on their weaknesses and their strengths and their confidence in, in serving you. And one of the things I, to give you an idea of my sales pitch is, I believe I'm an expert in helping a very certain type of venture fund um, that is being started. That's what I say my expertise is. And when I'm finishing my pitch, I basically say to the potential client, hey, every time you talk to someone just like myself, we all sound the same, we're all saying the same things. Ask them this one question, please. How many times have they worked with someone in their very first venture funds? Because that's the number one question for you. You need help. So for you as a founder, you need to sort of also be self-reflective enough to say, what do I need to know? And, and asking the service provider, let them tell you. And then you can ask all the next folks if that works. Or ask your friend who's a founder what they needed and see from that what question you should ask that you feel is of most value to you. And then from there, get their experience and see if it's a good fit for you. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question in the chat, uh, if we can send the recording. Um, yes, we can send the recording um, after the presentation. Uh, Michael, someone's wondering if you have any uh, book recommendations um, for entrepreneurs who are trying to learn more about this topic? So I found out of a book yesterday talking to someone who was an author of it called uh, Blitz Scaling. Um, so Blitz as in like a snow blitz, uh, Scaling. That's a, a really cool book for an entrepreneur to read, to understand, you know, how you take over the world with your business and what you should be trying to, trying to build. It'll give you an idea. And then, um, one of the other things that founders don't always place a lot of emphasis on is you're building a team. You're not going to just do this by yourself. If you want to build a, a really successful business, you could do it by yourself, but that's limited to your time. You're probably going to build a large business, which, mean, which means eventually you're going to end up managing people. So a book on um, management skills um, and leadership that I, that I really, I built my whole business around is called The Five Levels of, of Leadership. And it's written by uh, John C. Maxwell. And I believe personally that if, if you read that book, you'll understand how to get the best out of people because you'll understand what their role is in the organization. And you won't ask for more than they can deliver. And then the ones who are your best performers, you'll figure out using these skills and, and what you learn from reading this book, one, how to make them better and how that really helps you and the business in the long term. So there are two businesses, one on how to scale the business and one how to lead the team. Great. Um, just one more question, uh, again, a personal question from me, but you mentioned, you know, the ice cream business that wasn't paying their payroll tax for several years in a row. How does that happen? <laughs> We're just avoiding uh, this. And I get that that's probably a complicated answer. Uh, would probably um, needs more time than what we have. But I'm just curious how a company managed to avoid doing that and, and didn't realize it. Well, that was my question. I'd never <laughs> seen it before the first time um, and then I saw it again, right? Um, 
the interesting thing is I, I think it tells you a really small company like that, the, the government's checks and balances aren't there to catch it early. In, a, in an ideal world, you would hope that the federal government in this case would identify that you weren't doing something and send you a notice. But the truth is at that size, they're just, it's just not there. The scale's not there for them to, to capture and let you know that you're missing something. And what happened with these folks is they were doing the payroll themselves um, in-house. They weren't using an outside provider, an expert who would have taken care of all this for them. And that would have been just normal course of business, but they were trying to save money. They were trying to do everything as effectively as, and do all the, they were trying to do all the right things. They just didn't know. So they used a, you know, platform that was out there, they, they could log into, put the hours in, it told them how much to pay and how much to withhold. That system just didn't tell them about payroll tax and it wasn't remitted. Uh, one final question. Um, any particular types of software that you do recommend um, based on what you've seen if an entrepreneur decides that they want to do this themselves? So here, here's what I'd recommend. If you're a founder, and you're trying to build a product or a company, I would say the last thing you want to be doing with your spare hour every week or every two weeks or a couple of hours every month is do payroll. You should be spending that time personally, if I was looking to invest in you, to accelerate and expand on what your superpower is, which may be coding, might be some kind of whatever business it is. You can get this outsourced so cheaply now um, that I would just outsource it that way you don't have to worry about it they've got insurance if they get it wrong you won't pay they'll end up paying it put it on them there's providers out there that will do all this for you and it's just a matter of and then some of them are very cost effective because your level of hand holding is, is very low because you only have one or two employees um, there's others that will be you know the rolls royce of doing this which makes sense when you're 50 employees um, so just understanding where you're at and where to get the value I, I just recommend not doing it. This is not where you want to be the expert. You just want to know what's there. Great. Uh, well, we are at time. So, Michael, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. You're getting lots of thanks in the chat uh, with your um, uh, someone saying really good overview and actionable insights for me personally. So that's great to hear. Um, so thank you, Michael, for sharing your knowledge and thanks to all of you for participating today. Um, I will send out uh, the recording uh, later on this afternoon with a link to sign up for more workshops in our Entrepreneurship Essentials series. But with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you, everyone. It was a great opportunity. I appreciate everyone's time. Have a great day. Thanks, Michael. Have a good day, everyone.